Bulletproof Radio, a state of high performance. Hey, it's Dave Asprey with Bulletproof Radio. Today's cool fact of the day is that if you were an average person, which you're not, because let's face it, you're interested in high performance. High performers are not average performers. But let's assume you're an average person and you yelled consistently for eight years, seven months, and six days, you would produce enough energy to heat one cup of coffee. Unless, of course, you were my mother-in-law, in which case it might be a little bit less time. Just saying. Fortunately, I don't think she's listening to this. Sorry if you are. If you haven't had a chance to check out the Green Wave filter on Bulletproof.com, you should. I keep these little things plugged in in my kids' bedrooms, in my office, and what they do is they filter out random emanations from your household wiring. It's not a full protection, but it's one of those harm minimization strategies that I follow where having basically reverberations within your household wiring doesn't make for a calm electromagnetic environment. Filtering those out can improve sleep quality. I've certainly noticed that with a few clients and I've noticed that myself. So I have, an EM, uh, I have a Green Wave EMI filter plugged in. It's not a big part of what I do at Bulletproof, but it's something that I really rarely talk about, so I think you might benefit from that. So check it out on Bulletproof.com. Today's guest is gonna be amazing, and this is a podcast I've wanted to do for a while because He's an interesting entrepreneur, but he's also really talked about hacking fear. And I'm talking about Rave Mehta, who's a best-selling author of a book called The Inventor, The Story of Tesla, which is a best-selling nonfiction graphic novel based on Nikolai Tesla, who's one of my personal heroes. He's also a TED speaker, a professor, and a, a composer, a pianist, and a guy who's really focused on what's going on inside your head. So Rave, welcome to the show. Thank you, Dave. Great to be here. Now, we hang out with a lot of the same people. You were just saying that uh, you, were, you saw Stephen Kotler and Robert Cooper, who are two of the, the speakers from the Bulletproof Conference, uh, kind of the neuroscientists, but not looking at fixing problems, but neuroscientists looking at enhancing performance, sort of the, this new side of neuroscience. Um, how do you get to know all, all, all these kinds of people? Gosh, I just met him through other, other mutual friends of similar interest. Uh, Stephen I met over a year ago. Um, and he's just amazing. His books are amazing. And what he's doing is amazing, completely in line with my interest. And then uh, Robert's, you know, an innovation expert, you know, along lines of what I do as well. And uh, yeah, so many others. I mean, you had a pretty good group, pretty good crew at your conference. Look forward to seeing it next year. Awesome. Well, we'll make sure I get you some tickets for next year. Yeah. And it, it's one of those things where when you surround yourself with people who are asking big questions like that around fear, innovation, flow state, and one of the things that's interesting about you is you've actually focused what you do specifically on each of those things, and then you tied it all to music, which is not something that I have the skills to do. So let's talk about fear, because this okay. is one of those things that, that I didn't realize was affecting my, my performance as a human in relationships as an entrepreneur at all in, in, in my 20s, and it took me a while to even recognize what it was. So what is fear to you? So that's a big question. Fear to me is the one, let me back up actually. So in my research, I spent 15 years kind of hacking, researching, chasing fear, just to understand what it looks like and how it works. And what I found is there's really just one force, one life force. Um, you know, sometimes we call it flow, you know, the flow state. That's what we tap into. But I like to refer to it as love, the kind of the binding force that binds everything together and through which everything's created. Now, did, the two, you just say, did you say love? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I mean, so are you like some kind of a hippie? I mean, no. the hair's a little bit long. I, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> I'm in full agreement with you, by the way, but yeah. some people listening are like, what's this guy talking about? So you got to go deeper on that. So everyone Yeah, well, I will. So, so, there's, so if there's one force that exists, essentially, that kind of connects everything, that's what I'd refer to it as. You know, George Lucas calls it the force, you know. East Asia, they call it chi. You know, India calls it prana. I just refer to it as love. The, the, it's it's midichlorian mediated. The mm -hmm. yeah. No, no, I'm talking about the Star Wars. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Is it Mandorian? Anyway, it's Mandorian. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so um, so there are two forces that act on it on this okay. you know life force. So it's just which is the source of our flow, right? So the one force is fear, and that constrains our pipe for how much of this flow or this 
life force we get in. And then the other is the opposite, what I call, or what we refer to as trust. And that opens the pipe. So we get more of this life force or love or whatever flowing through us. So fear is really, what I discovered is all negative emotions is rooted in fear. So whether it's anger, jealousy, you know, insecurity, greed, guilt, shame, any of that stuff, the source emotion is fear. And then similarly, all positive emotions are rooted in trust, like confidence, grace, you know, or gratitude, humility, confidence, um, you know, courage, all that stuff comes out of trust. So if I, when I broke it down to just those two fundamental kind of forces acting on the source of our flow, it made it so much simpler for me to like work with it and see how I could transform these fear-based emotions into trust and open up more flow. The ends of the spectrum for you are fear and trust. Right. But, but the, trust in what? Like trust in your fear? No. No, no. <laughs> like so, what, are you, what are you trusting in? So you trust. So, okay. There's a spectrum to trust. You know, it starts with, and the same with fear. You know, fear starts with doubt, leads to skepticism, and ultimately leads to fear. And then fear paralyzes you, right? So the opposite is trust. It starts with hope, and it moves up the scale until you have full trust in essentially your, the universe, your place in it, you know, all the events happening around you. You have a sense of comfort that everything is working in your favor. And um, you may not know all the answers or why yet, but you have that sense of trust. And that's when, you've, when you're in that state of ultimate trust, that's when you're tapped into ultimate flow. And, and we see that. We see that like when we're really present, you're in a state of trust. Right. When you move away from being present, you allow fear to come in, all the what if questions. So the more further you're out in the future, the more room for fear to enter. And being present is just one of the three pillars of fear that I kind of came up with or I discovered, you know, um, time. So fear is always based in the future. You know, what if this happens? What if that happens? Many times it's stimulated by the past and then we experience it in the present. However, when you're very present, there's no room for fear. So that's when you're in a state of trust because you're in flow. You're completely in the moment. So you have to be trusting. So when you're in the moment, you can't be afraid. No, there's no room exactly. for fear. Exactly. Okay. Right. I, I totally, totally okay. agree with that. So, so the second pillar of fear is, so the first is time. The second is attachment. So there are two types of attachment. First, I was kind of like, oh, maybe we shouldn't have attachments. And then I, over time, realized, no, there's nothing wrong with attachment. It's the nature of how we are attached to these objects or subjects of our attachment. And there are two types. One is a rigid attachment, something that kind of like a steel beam connecting you to the object of your attachment. And if there's any, and there's always these universal forces acting on you, right? That's creating stress. If there's enough stress in opposite directions, then that beam that's connecting you to snaps and you just slingshot away from each other. And the whole experience is miserable because there's stress in the whole time. The other type of attachment is what I call gravitational or orbital attachment. That's when there's nothing holding you in place. It's just your own gravity and the gravity of whatever it is that's, you know, the object of your attachment um, that's keeping you guys within each other's, you know, force or, or field. And when all these universal forces push on you and it, you just rotate around each other, but there's no stress in the system. And as dynamics change, you can naturally gravitate away from each other or closer together. But once again, it's natural. There's no stress in the system. So changing from a rigid attachment to an orbital attachment was another pillar of fear that I found would break down fear. And the difference between the two is when you're in a rigid attachment situation, you are focused on the attachment and where it should be. You're trying to control it. Where in a gravitational attachment, you're actually focused on yourself and becoming a better person or growing you know, in, in every aspect. And that's attracting those things, the right things into your space and pushing the wrong things away. So it's just a slight shift in mindset from focus, instead of focusing on something else, focusing on yourself, and then everything corrects itself. And then the third is um, a very specific type of attachment. It's an attachment to a specific outcome. I call that an expectation. So when you have an expectation, you know, the thing about an expectation is if you achieve an expectation, there's no real glory or joy because you expected it, right? But if you don't, then there's all this dismay and you know, disappointment and demoralization that takes place that brings your flow state down. However, what I found if we change your expectations to preferences and leaving the final outcome of how that intention is served, that when you achieve it, then there's this great 
joy and elation that takes place. And when you don't, you still leave it open for other ways of that initial intention being satisfied. So going back, there's no problem with having goals. You know, um, it's just attaching a certain very specific form and outcome to that goal may not necessarily be in the best interest of your intention of why you set the goal to, you know, to, um, in the first place. So changing the expectation to preference because expectation is very tied to form. Preference is tied to the intention. Um, just that subtle shift in mindset opens it up. And it turns out any one of these three pillars, time, attachment, and expectation, if you knock any one of those three down, that fear just goes away because all three of them have to be active for fear to exist. Interesting. So does that mean if you have none of those active, can you get rid of your fear completely? Yeah, so it, it's even if you just get one of them, fear goes away. So if you're present, then the other two don't matter because they just because they're embedded in each other, right? So the other two go away. But if you can't be present, say you have to plan for something in the future, then you move to the next pillar, attachment, right? So if you could change the nature of attachment, then then your fear goes away. But if you can't because it's a short-term thing that you need to really control and manage, then you move to expectation. If you could change that to a preference, then that gets rid of fear. So there's a, kind of like a cascade effect. So, so now I'll take a, a ridiculous example here, but okay. like I really want to understand fear, and I think a lot of people listening to this, like everyone knows that fear plays a role in their life. Everyone wants to have control over their fear, and, and you're writing your book about how to hack fear. So, like I'm, I'm going to go deep on this, and you can tell me sure. something ridiculous. I'm okay with that. Sure, sure. All right. So now there's a tiger in midair, right? Okay, crouching at you, mm -hmm. or no, whatever, crouching, you, jumping at you, like ready to take yeah. a bite. All right. So you're like, well, I'm feeling like I'm in the present moment maybe, but I'm sort of attached to the outcome of not being torn to bits. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. And, so, uh, so great, great example. <laughs> like I would prefer not to be eaten. <laughs> like, right. am I really going to be able to banish fear and act? Uh, or like, uh, just walk me through. It seems like, sure. like there's a visceral kind of fear that's survival based that, that maybe being present isn't the solution for not being afraid of the tiger tearing you to pieces. So I had a similar experience actually. So I was in uh, South African safari and we were observing a pride of lions, you know, take down an elephant. And wow. as we we're sitting there, one of the lions, you know, we we're in our cart, and one of the lions actually walked up to me. I was in the front seat in the front left corner, and so closest to the ground. And it literally walked up to me. And I have a picture because I was taking pictures of it as it's coming closer until my ranger said, Stop moving. <laughs> stop breathing. He <laughs> said, Stop moving, stop breathing, pretend you don't exist. Uh, I could feel the breath of the lion on my forearm. And wow. I sat there and it's just looking and observing. He's trying to figure me out. He's trying to figure out if I, probably if I was edible or not. <laughs> so naturally, my mind wandered in the future. like, oh my God, what if this is going to be the worst way to die? Da, 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 da. You know, all those what if questions. So I was in the future. You know, I had the attachment to <laughs> not dying in my body. And then I had the expectation of, you know, wanting to survive. But it wasn't until I pulled myself into present. I used a breathing exercise that got me very present got me very settled and I didn't feel, I felt comfortable. I had the trust kind of reemerged in me. I said, everything's going to be fine. And then it wasn't within seconds of me feeling that way that the lion walked, got up and just walked away. They and sense, animals, they animals sense, sense that they sense it. And so do we, we sense it too. Yeah. We're not necessarily yeah. conscious of it all the time, but we all sense each other's feels. And the question, you know, in that scenario is what led up to the tiger or lion wanting to pounce on you? Cause it wasn't like all of a sudden you've gotten a, you know, state of fear when he was mid air, there's a series of things that would attract him towards you possibly that could, um, that could lead to you being in a, in that state. And in, in that state, if you're present, you would know what to do. You can move out of the way, you know how to maneuver because you wouldn't, you'd be in flow state. You wouldn't be paralyzed. Uh, I, I think it was uh, Alberto Viotto, who's a, a shaman and a cultural anthropologist who's been on Bulletproof Radio. He's a, he's a friend. And uh, if I'm quoting him right, he said something like, if you get bitten by a snake, you go to the doctor, right? It, like, if you want to know what to do when you're bitten by a snake, you go to the doctor. If you want to know why you got bitten by the snake, you go to the shaman. Yeah. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> uh, which kind of illustrates what you're saying. Like, yeah. you do, if, if you're living in a state of fear, I believe anyway, and it's been my experience, that you, you attract the things you don't want into your life. Yeah. And if you're living in a state of flow or a state of presence or a state of gratitude or whatever the antidote that you have is, is for fear in your life, at least most of the time, like I think a technical term is good shit happens. And I, I don't know, is that kind of where you're going with this? Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like we, we give off fields, right? And everything's giving off a field and we track the fields that we're giving off. So we're essentially, they're like, 
yeah. give off fields. So all the scientists listening to this and doctors like give off fields. What kind of a field? Do you know what kind of a field? Yeah, you're ener- about? energetic fields. I feel like there's there's um, and this is this is not. Uh, I mean, this is provable. Um, it is you know, science. Yeah, you know, I mean, you could you could uh, you could do muscle testing and muscle test a different thought pattern, or you know, like even the I forgot his name, Mokamoto, who who tested the crystalled water, right? Where you put emotions yeah. on the water and the different crystalline formations form when they froze them. So our thoughts have energetic qualities and we give off these energetic qualities all the time. And everything there's, there are things receiving that. So things that kind of correlate with them come into our space and those that don't move away. It's rough because uh, if you look at Lynn McTaggart's work around the, the field, mm-hmm. there's great amounts of evidence that there's something going on, mm-hmm. but we haven't, at least in my knowledge, figured out how to directly measure those fields using instruments outside of us, which is irritating. Yeah. Right? But, but we can measure what I would guess happened with your lion. Uh, and that's actually a magnetic field, and it does come off your heart, and it is right. trainable, and that, that's something that I do. And uh, Do you work with heart rate variability at all? Yeah. yeah. So. Uh, okay, so, so let's talk about what you do with heart rate variability. Okay. Uh, what uh, what do you do with that? Because that's one of those direct, yeah. measurable, you can see it, you can feel it, you can look at it with a, a magnetic field detector, and we know that it interacts with other people. So so let's, for the skeptics sure. listening, okay. w- this is something that is beyond the field of skepticism, where it's measurable, right. quantifiable, mm-hmm. and we know it affects other beings. Right. So let's assume that it's magnetic, even though it may be a lot more than that. Okay, yeah. and we'll go from there, just just to okay. help people do a thought experiment here around fear. So go ahead. Okay, well, I mean, the way, the way I work with heart variability is I use different breathing techniques to okay. help me get into different states to give off different, you know, different, I guess, heart fields, I guess, for lack of a better word. Sure. Um, so, I, you know, I haven't gone through an extensive process of measuring the different, the different, uh, you know, fields or frequencies that I'm giving off, but I do, I could definitely notice a change in different techniques and, yeah. and you know, and, and, it, and this goes all the way back to even like Vedic sciences in our culture Right, so they figured this out thousands of years ago. <laughs> it's not new. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's not new. We're just using different instruments to figure out how it works yeah. and a different lens. So, um, so you know, as, as a yoga teacher and practitioner, I mean, I've been using breathing techniques and meditation techniques for a while, and 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 really managing um, managing my own state, you know, with those. You know, there, there's a great there's a video game that uh, Deepak Chopra showed me once uh, a couple years ago, and he used a bio. Um, one of those finger clips to, to uh, track your pulse. Um, yeah. or, you know, it was called a biosensor, but really a pulse tracker. And in the game, he would have you do different breathing techniques. And as you got your heartbeat, got the range of what they're looking for based on this biosensor, um, you know, whatever you're trying to accomplish would start to happen. Like the balls and the oh, grass yeah. would start to juggle. Yeah. Um, and you, I, and, and you, tra- yeah. And you train you in different techniques to, to move through this you know, journey, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And, um, the, and, and the that, game, by the way, for, for listeners, yeah. um, it's my, my buddy Kyle runs it. Uh, it's called wild divine. It was the first biofeedback video game. That's right. the one you're talking about. Yeah, yeah exactly. Money yeah, okay, exactly. Cool. That's exactly right. right. Yeah. And, um, and that was years ago. That was, I mean, that was fairly ahead of his time. I would say yeah. it was, it was like late nineties. I yeah. think when it came out or something like that. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Very ahead of his time, but you know, in a similar way he was using the heart rate variability to, show some kind of direct feedback from a video game standpoint. Mm-hmm. So, Oh, and you worked in the video game industry, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That, that's why you've seen it. Okay. It was, it was, it was not a major success. I was kind of no. surprised. Okay. No, it wasn't, but I don't think, I don't think, you know, some, a lot of things I've done and I'm sure you've experienced sometimes if we're too early, you know, yeah. it's all timing, right? It doesn't mean it's, it's not a good product of quality. It just means the timing's off. The market's not yeah. ready or the audience isn't ready for it. So, so as a yoga teacher, you know, you've, um, you, you recognize that when you do different breathing exercises, they do something to your, your heart, mm-hmm. right? And like the heart opening meditation, <laughs> like it, it, that's in more than a few types of meditation yeah. uh, teaching. Sure. Uh, so you're doing this and that does affect heart rate variability. And, and then you're noticing that it has an effect on the people or the things around you, right? And, sure. and in the case of the lion, you were in a state of fear because it's a normal thing to happen when mm-hmm. you feel like a carnivore sniffing your arm to see if it's made out of bacon. <laughs> um, and then you overcame that using a breathing exercise. And the second you overcame it, the lion was like, oh, not food. Because it doesn't have the fear of food, right? Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. 
so th that's an example of where you totally hacked your fear in, in a very substantial way. Um, so now let's say that I'm, let's go to another example. And this is one where a, a few of my clients have this, you know, they're super successful with it. It's like, I, if I go on stage, I'll die. Right. Right. Like, like flat, flat out, I have stage fright. Like I, I will not go in front of a group of people and talk. And you're like, well, it's kind of what you do if you're going to be in a leadership role is you need to be able to talk about what you're doing and to be able to be in a state of flow when you do it. But the fear blocks the flow or the flow cancels the fear. Mm -hmm. What do you tell someone who wants to hack that kind of fear? Yeah, sure. It's funny. I just did a show called Aspire, uh, which was different than any of my other shows. It was a piano concert coupled with kind of like a TED-like series of talks where I curated the piano pieces to the different mm -hmm. talks. And what was different about this, it was this time it was just me. It was completely wow. me. It was me and a mic and me and a piano, and there's no other distractions. There's no PowerPoints. There's no other dancers on stage, no visuals. It was raw. And, and intentionally, I was, I was wanting to push my boundaries. And and it's probably, I'd say, out of everything I've done, I mean, I've jumped out of planes, swam with sharks, you know, dove off cliffs. I mean, everything I've done, you know, almost got eaten by a lion. That was probably the scariest thing I've probably ever done. Wow. And because it was raw, I had to be so vulnerable that... Um, that I had to just expose myself and be who I was. Otherwise, it wouldn't have worked. So I would say for someone that's going on stage, the key to being on stage in front of a bunch of people and being a great performer or a great, you know, having a great presence is vulnerability. It's so counterintuitive yeah. to everything we've been taught. You know, we layer ourselves with all this armor, you know, our identities, our, who we are, who we think we are. And it starts to, after a while, it starts to get heavy and we start to block kind of this, quality that makes us unique and special makes us real and people feel that people feel can feel the difference when someone is laden with armor and then and when they're stripped naked and in every case a person is more attracted to a person that is much more vulnerable and open and authentic than they are in the other way around no matter how amusing they are now that's a, a very very deep statement vulnerability is something I mean, like you should be afraid if, if you're an animal mm -hmm. let's say you're a deer if you're vulnerable right like you're going to be constantly searching for the threats because you have no defenses and yet you're saying that for people to be most effective on especially in a, in a stage like that they need to be vulnerable how do you and this especially for men this is really challenging it took me years to learn how to be vulnerable i'm probably still working on it on some subtle levels but for actually for both genders, but I know men just have a bigger problem with this because of the way our culture is. Um, how do you recommend people practice being vulnerable? Or like, how do you get into a vulnerable state if it's not mm -hmm. a state that feels natural for you? Sure. Well, one of the things I figured out is, okay, we get into these flow bubbles, right? So we'll be in a life-threatening situation or a challenge that we want to achieve. And we get present, we get in the moment, we're in a state and we do what we need to do and we get through it. And, and we celebrate afterwards. But now we're no longer in that state. Kind of like, you know, like Danny Mance when he jumped the Great Wall of China. You know, he was in a flow state for the few jumps and then after that he's in the hospital, <laughs> right? So, <laughs> so, cause he broke, he shattered his leg. So, um, yeah. so what, how do you sustain your flow state? How do you level up your flow state? Was, was the next question I had. It's like, okay, now I know how to get in flow states. I can get into those no mind states, but how do I keep it? And that's where vulnerability, that's where I figured out that vulnerability was the pathway to do that because the more authentic we become, the closer to our authentic selves, the higher our flow grade levels up automatically. And so then it went back to, okay, well, vulnerability is scary because we're afraid of getting hurt, right? We're afraid of getting hurt in any way, physical, emotionally, spiritually, whatever sense. What I'd add to that is vulnerability with awareness, with trust. So... Trust is never meant to be blind, and nor is vulnerability. It's not meant to be a naive vulnerability. It's meant to be a vulnerability with awareness. So, and you could achieve both. So if you're aware, which means you're in flow, um, then you could be open and still be completely high performing or, or safe, you know, whatever the case is. And what it does is it strengthens your emotional immune system. So we have our physical immune system, but we also have an emotional immune system that never gets exercised if we constantly have our armor on. So it just gets weaker. And the minute that our armor gets stripped off, like if we fall into a health crisis, you don't have the energy to hold on to that armor anymore. You know, the ego just has to melt away because it takes a lot of energy to hold on to it. All those emotions just go away. Then you, then you really feel like how 
then you really feel vulnerable. You really get a sense of that, right? So, and everyone will go through a health crisis because everyone dies. So at some point they will experience some kind of crisis <laughs> in their life yeah. and get a sense of that vulnerability. It's almost like by design. It you, was created. You, know, you obviously don't know my transhumanist friends. <laughs> I, I, know the, the one, I know a few of them. <laughs> you, I know a few of them. I imagine you must. Yeah. The ones who, who believe they're not going to die, which would be a state of invulnerability, which means if that does happen, they might be in for some rough times. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, well, I mean, they have an expectation, <laughs> right? Versus, yeah, it depends <laughs> on if it's a preference or an expectation. Now, if they prefer not to die, that's one thing. But it, let's assume that they will die, like everyone I, has. I, I think it's, <laughs> it, it, it's a safe and, assumption, and, right? All right, I'm not going to name who it is, but one of the very major figures in, in that in that field. Um, Ray Kurzweil. I met him. Uh, no, I, I won't name who it is, um, okay. but a, a guy I, I respect greatly. Yeah. Um, one of the the original transhumanists. Um, I met him before he called himself transhumanist, and we were talking about anti aging and all this stuff. Uh, and I'm like, look, we're all going to die, and and he was horribly offended. I'm like, no, listen, the universe will come to an end. Like, like, we're all going to die. It doesn't matter what you do. Like, it is inevitable because of the fact that we think the universe will collapse back in. And, uh, and I, I actually think I pissed him off uh, <laughs> because of that. And it's like, no, really, like, I believe you can extend human lifetimes a very large amount. I'm planning on at least 180. Um, but <laughs> come, come on here. Like, like, the planet will crumble at some point. Yeah. Anyway, I'm getting off topic here. But uh, so, so you, I took you out of, out of your flow as well. So you were going through this whole process around, uh, around fear of death and what's going to happen there with vulnerability. So let's, let's get back to that. Yeah, so I, I found that the more vulnerable I am, the more flow I have access to, which levels me up, my, you know, my flow straight, which allows me to do more. It gives me more potential because I'm not using that energy to hold on to, thing, you know, to false identities or to, to get too attached to them anymore. So I have all this energy available to me that I can use to create and explore and discover and and uh, do th productive things, you know, things that will level me up, expand my being. When I do neurofeedback, like the, the 40 Years of Zen program with electrodes and lie detectors for seven days, where I'm um, basically looking at what's going on in my brain, you find that, that you find that there's a problem because when you work on being in a vulnerable state, the parts of your brain that you don't normally have control over unless you're trained to have control over them, they'll immediately snap you out of the vulnerable state because those parts of your brain are responsible for keeping the meat of your body alive. Like it's the meat operating system that does it. And you're like, I want to be vulnerable. It's like, yeah, right over my dead body. And, and, and there's this inner dialogue like that. So, I mean, I know so many people okay. are so defended. Like, like how do they crack through that defense? How do you hack that? Okay, so, so here there's two things that there are two parts of this. So let's go back to fear for a second. So when, and tr fear and trust, and trust, okay. I couple trust with awareness, right? So, um, and fear with ignorance. So those are the two sides, right? So say I'm walking down the street and I see a pothole in front of me. When I look at a pothole, I notice it and I walk around it, right? Now in that process, I could have looked at the pothole and be Scared, oh my God, what if I trip? What if I slip? What if I break my ankle? What if I you know, fall and hit my face? Or I could notice that there's a pothole there and the solution is to walk around it. Okay. Right? So now let's say there's a snake in that pothole. I walk up to it. Now there's you know, a little more fear-inducing element, right? Same thing. I still walk around the pothole. So the difference is, in that case, I could have been scared. What if that snake bites me? What if, you know, once again, what if I slip? What if I fall? What if I, you know, what if it's poisonous? Or I can notice it, be aware of it, and then move around it. And, and that's where trust and flow comes in is you just know what to do. Because fear, when you, if you hit the fear state, and sometimes we move back and forth between fear and trust, fear and awareness, and that's what we call hesitation. So when you're not hesitating, when you're hesitating, you're moving back between awareness and, and paralysis, awareness, paralysis, awareness, paralysis, you know, fears, paralysis, and trust is awareness. So, so, but when you're afraid, you're stuck and you're stuck. You don't know what to do. But then when you snap back into trust, that's when you move around and solve, find solutions for whatever the situation is. So I, I think the same thing in vulnerability is a form of trust because for you to be vulnerable, you have to trust that you're going to be okay. Right. Yeah. So, and then when you're vulnerable and you're trusting, then you're aware that, you know, what's going on. So, but the minute you hit, you hit something and all of a sudden you, you hit a fear state, you, you stop, you get paralyzed. Yep. And then the hesitation is the dance between the awareness and, and the paralysis. So. 
And, and people can feel when you're vulnerable. Like, like all of the best presentations I've ever given are when you yeah. like you go up there without the the defenses up, right? And then there's there's a certain type of person who's like senses vulnerability and then tries to exploit it. We, we call them bullies. Yeah. And you know they they exist in in high school and and grade school and they exist as adults too, mm-hmm. right? You know they're, they're the ones who are always tearing other people down instead of saying I don't agree with you. It's like you're a you know you're a scumbag or whatever. Like. like there's somewhere two percent of the population are, are sociopaths and stuff like that. What do you recommend, or in your own experience, just hacking fear? What do you recommend people do when they go into a state of vulnerability and then they come across one of these people who looks to exploit vulnerability? Sure. So when I say vulnerability, I do not imply a weakness. No, no, not at all. Yeah, but yeah. if you if you show up as vulnerable, like there will right. be people who are like like you know they'll, they'll yeah. try and take advantage of it. you. Don't have to let them, but no, no, try. That, no, because you're yeah. yeah you're you're creating an attractive force. You're going to draw people mm-hmm. to you because people are attracted to vulnerability and authenticity, right? Authenticity. Mm-hmm. So so I mean, and it goes back to being aware. So you know, there's this there's this other. I'll give you an example. So there's this other thing I talk about in Aspire in my show, where I talk about how to tap into these flow states, and vulnerability is one of these pieces, one of these talks. Another one is the power of yes. And I talk about how yes, just even the word yes, increases your ability to tap into flow state. You have more flow just by saying the word yes. So, you know, most people, you know, the second most recognized word in the world is no. You know, Coke is the first one, but no is the second one. And <laughs> no, really? Yes, this is true. At least it was. I don't know if that's changed. I'm sure it hasn't changed. But, uh, um, but so it makes, you know, it makes you wonder that there's so many people saying no, at least the world understands no, but very few understand yes. So... I had the, I took him through an exercise where they had to say yes after everything I said. And you could see the energy in the room just increasing yes by yes. Every yes they said, they increased. Cool. And then I took him through the same exercise, having to say no to everything I said. And then the first time they said no, the game was over. And they could see the extreme cutoff between this beautiful journey and fun journey and adventure they took by saying yes all the way through to this immediate hard stop no that they said. And cut off all information, all potential to them, you know, from the, from the minute they said no. So you could say yes. So the idea is, okay, say yes leads you to opportunity and potential. But you could say no by saying yes, right? So say, I say yes to you, and we could go through an exercise, and then you ask me some ridiculous question. All right, t- let, t- take me through that. I'm sure okay. people listening would, would love to do that. And by the way, if you're watching, you'll probably get more out of this if you watch on YouTube just because yeah. like we're seeing each other. But all right, all right. So, so, so what do I do? Do I ask you a ridiculous question or other way around? Just ask me whatever you want me to do or whatever you, you, know, whatever you feel, and, I'll, and I'll, tr- you know, I'll try to demonstrate what I mean. All right, right. so I'm going to try and break this just because I'm a hacker as well, right? So let, let's see. Uh, d- does your mom know that you're an accountant? Uh. <laughs> Yes, she knows I have financial and accounting you know, classes that I've taken in school. Uh, okay, cool. Um, so I suppose being an accountant isn't a terrible confession, but you know, it, it could have been, does your mom know you're an ex-murderer? Um, she, my, mo- my mom knows that I am a, I have no criminal it, record. So. It didn't sound like a yes. <laughs> well, no, but the point being is I'm directing you into... Okay. Well, I'm not saying no. My mom does not know that I'm an expert. Or my, you, yeah. Okay, but so by not saying no, you're you're leaving it open and then you're qualifying it. Okay, I, I get right. what you're saying. Right. All right. See the, cool. the idea of you know if you, so there's what I call I call this yesing. Right. You say yes to things when people ask you to do things or ask you to explore things. You know, you start with yes because you want to mm-hmm. open that information flow to you. Right. Yeah. Um, and then when they start asking you things that start to fall out of your realm of interest, then if you get good at this, you could say yes, still say yes, but redirect them to moving into the realm where you are interested in. So, mm-hmm. so when you're asking me, say you ask me, hey, can I bring you a cup of coffee right now? Clearly, that's not possible because I'm here and you're you know, across the coast, across the other side of the continent. But I can say yes, next time I see you, I'll bring you a cup of coffee. Nice. Yeah. So yes, yes with an asterisk. I, I get you there. Right, okay. right. You could, condition, right. you could condition your yeses and then redirect their behavior. But when you do that, what happens is they feel validated and they become much more open to your conditions. Okay. And how does that tie back to like fear and vulnerability? I, I think well, I'm... well, the point being is when, when you had, so I had a six-year-old that I was mentoring and this is that situation, situation set up. He, you know, he was a, um, from a, you know, a divorced family, had a lot of built up anger and resentment. I had, I put him through this emotional kind of self evaluation where every time he gets angry, I tell him to sit on the couch until he's not angry anymore and then come and rejoin whatever we're doing. 
So after a few times of doing that, he started recognizing when he was getting angry himself to the point where he would self he would put himself on the couch. And then after a while, he just stopped getting angry. So, and that's within a three-week period of time. So he became self-evaluative of his emotions, became self-aware, right? So now he had a bully in school, and this bully was a female, but she was like a heavier you know, woman, bigger girl, and she's bullying him and his friends and whatnot. He had so much confidence at that point that he actually went to the bully and told her that, hey, look, the reason you don't have any friends is because you're so mean to everybody, and if you weren't so mean to everybody, then you would have more friends. In fact, I want to be your friend but you don't let me be a friend because you're so mean. Next thing you know, the very next day, he, t- he spoke truth because he's vulnerable to her, right? Mm-hmm. The very next day, that girl started being nice to everyone, and then a week later, they all were playing together like they were not. You know, there was no, um, there was no problems. You know, that, that could never happen. And, and wow. that, that's an example of from a, from a you know, first grade level, but the first graders are, you know, they're rough. <laughs> they can be rough because they... You know, oh, they, yeah. they imbibe all their parental and other, you know, environmental factors and they don't have a filter. So, so um, just by being vulnerable and being confident in your, and speaking truth, I guess, in that case, um, and letting them know that you're a good person, just show that, you know, kind of melted those walls and then, and she transformed. It, it was pretty powerful. I was pretty amazed that it even happened to myself when, when he told us that, the story. That's pretty cool. Yeah. I want to talk more about your your Aspire piece because you're one of the few guys that I know who's, who's talked about expressing scientific knowledge through art or being a meta human. Mm-hmm. Talk about those concepts. Like, why sure. do you need art to express scientific knowledge? Wow, because I feel like we learn through stories, and and I mean, we imbibe information. We can imbibe facts and whatnot, but we don't connect to it as deeply until there's some kind of story that either we create ourselves or that we relate to. So we are, um, we are look, we're pattern searching machines, right? And, and we're looking for connection, essentially. And when, we, when we're looking for, when we look at scientific data, there's two levels of it. There's one that, okay, we observe it as an outsider, we notice it, and that's it. And then there's the data that we actually experience and can connect to. And that's way more valuable, right? So than being just an observer and, and taking note. So, because then you could do stuff with that. So, uh, so I feel like art is a way of bringing that experience into and that connection into whatever information I'm trying to communicate across. And I found it to be really effective. Like the graphic novel Nikola Tesla. You know, that story has been told in lots of different books. But the way kids connected to it most is because of the art, the visuals. The visuals brought, and not just kids, adults too. I mean, um, the visuals is what attracted people into the story. And then the story tells the facts of history, right? Um, and you know, I learned this in the gaming industry. You can build the best game, the most amazing game with the best game mechanics, but it's the art that sells you, that hooks you in. And once you get hooked, and then it's the mechanics and the actual gameplay that keeps you there. So, so I don't know, art sells and, and then the truth changes you, I guess, the, the mechanics of how I feel like we as humans absorb and learn and express. The book there, I, I love that you chose to do this. Yeah. And I wanted to switch gears and talk about the book anyway. Okay. So your, your timing's perfect. You wrote about something that, that very few people know shaped really much of, much of our worlds we know today, which is the fight between Nikola Tesla and Thomas Edison where basically we're pretty sure that, uh, well, Tesla stole some stuff from Royal Rife and Thomas Edison stole some stuff from Tesla and all three of them probably stole some stuff from each other or the more enlightened perspective on that maybe is that when ideas come, they typically emerge in at least three places. Um, A lot of people don't believe that, but a friend of mine, uh, Mark Limley, a Stanford law professor, actually wrote a paper documenting that within our patent system that that many new ideas emerged in multiple points, just like it was time for them to come out. And one person got the patent, but there was usually a couple other people working on it. So we have good evidence. This is the way. But anyway, we have these three guys, and you chose the two big ones, Tesla and Edison, and they fought about alternating current versus direct current, which is the dumbest thing you'd ever think of to fight about unless you're an engineer. So (laughs) tell me why this is important and why you did a graphic novel about it. Gosh, because, you know... It wasn't the, that specific battle that I was focusing on. It's more of the human yeah. emotional journey that he had to go through that we all go through. I mean, 
That story is really the story of any creator, artist, entrepreneur, inventor, anyone that wants to put an idea into this world, even someone that wants to create a family. It's still creation. You know, and all the hurdles you have to go through mm-hmm. to get there. And you, you have economic hurdles, you have physical hurdles, but the most but the hurdles that every single person goes through is the emotional ones, right? The ups and downs. And then how do you persist through that? So the bigger the stakes, the higher those hurdles are on the and the higher that roller coaster and emotional um, turbulence you're gonna you're gonna you know run into. And then it goes back to fear. So if you know how to move from fear to trust then you could take these high amplitudinal waves and make them soft waves and move through that space much quicker and more efficiently. So his, his journey was epic in the sense of, okay, he, he brought light and power to the world, but it's completely relatable to everyone's journey, you know, whether you're, you know, especially artists and creators and inventors and you know, entrepreneurs. So it had so many layers to it that I just felt like that story had to be told on that many levels. And, um, and the guy had... Some, he had, a, I mean, it shows that he had a destiny and, um, and he pushed through, I mean, he almost died, right? When he was young. So he, you know, he had, uh, cholera and his, mm-hmm. and his brother died from it and everyone's dying from it. But at the last minute, he somehow just had a miraculous, he just miraculously healed himself because his father said, okay, I'll let you go to university instead of, you know, um, instead of his religious, pursuing his religious, uh, school, schooling. So, and all of a sudden... He, he had enough, all the flow came back to him and he just, and, and it healed him. So, uh, and that happened several times throughout the, throughout the story. He almost died, but somehow he just continued to move through those spaces. So, I know, I feel that story is really important on so many levels. And, and the focus, the point, I, point of view I took was his human journey. So the, the human journey is, is definitely powerful with Tesla. Yeah. And I, I have a lot of his, his old papers and stuff and I, I've studied his work. A lot of people don't know that Tesla was looking at uh, biology as well as electricity. Like he's famous for his electrical stuff, but some of the first vibrating platforms were made by Tesla. Um, and in fact, there's a famous story. This is like the bulletproof vibe. I manufacture a vibrating platform that's you know the great, 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 great grand, grandson, granddaughter, grandchild um, of the kind of research they were doing. But Tesla had, if memory serves, in his lab a... Uh, a vibrating platform, and if you put it down to eight hertz, it would basically make you poop on yourself, like, like, like very reliably. And, yeah. and I, I've played with different frequencies, and it, it has a very stimulating effect, we'll put it that way, disaster pants uh, frequencies. And uh, so he would actually warn people, come love, like, like, don't stay on there too long, don't do this, like it's strong, because he was looking at the effect of vibrations, and there's sound vibrations, there's physical vibrations, there's light as a you know, vibrating or particle, we saw him figure that one out. There's music, like there's all these things, but Tesla was about the vibrations as much as he was anything else. Um, so that that's why I've yeah. always been interested in him because it, it's like electrical plus uh, plus biochemical, and the the reason that that I think the ACDC thing, which is the the context for your story, mm-hmm. is interesting, is that direct current doesn't create the electromagnetic fields that are harmful, um, but alternating current does. So there was a, a big fight around, you know, do, do we have a direct current electrical grid or do we have an alternating current electrical grid? And they chose one that was economically interesting but biologically harmful, as far as I can tell at this point. Certainly not biologically optimal. And the degree of harmfulness, I don't know, but it doesn't appear to be ideal. We'll just put it that way. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I appreciated that you, uh, you had put the story together around a really fascinating thing that, that's affecting people, but it's really it's about an, an interesting person. Yeah. Um, is there a cool fact about Tesla that no one knows that you came across when you were doing this? Yeah, there's this quote I say in Aspire, kind of popping back to Aspire a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I, I talk about, um, and this to me, this really connected with me because it, you know, it's really powerful. You know, we talked about like how, um, how we are these, essentially, we're cosmic specks in this universe, right? If a meteor came and just wiped out the planet, the universe wouldn't miss us. It would move on. It would continue to move on and, and continue to unfold in the way it's already doing so, right? So, but then it t- kind of takes me back to like, well, then what, what's unique about us? Why are we even here? What's the point? Right? And, and it came to me, it didn't hit me until Tesla said this, but he said that if all the forces in the universe, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but he said that if all the forces, you know, according to the law of conservation of energy, 
you can't create energy or destroy energy. So therefore, all the forces in the universe will cancel each other out to maintain complete balance and harmony of the universe. So if that's true, then the only thing left is thought. And therefore, a single thought can determine the entire motion of the universe because it's outside of those physical boundaries. It's outside of the physics of how the universal forces work, matter, energy, so on and so forth. So I was like, wow. So if that's true, a single thought, and you know, unfortunately, like a lot of our thoughts on this planet cancel each other out, so we end up with trickles of what could be a powerful thought um, or powerful collective thought. But um, if a single thought has that much influence on this universe, it has a ripple effect. I mean, our thought can be heard or felt across the universe. You know, And what's interesting is we know this because we now implement double-blind experiments because we know that our thought affects the outcome you know, on a more local level, yeah. right? We have, we, we have what we call, um, uh, what's the word when, uh, I'll come back to me, but you know, when, when the random, the, random number generator kind of stuff or something. No, no, no. We, we, like when we're in, uh, when we heal, like say we're sick and also we feel better because someone told us some, uh, oh, spontaneous healing kind of stuff. No, or? um, Oh, come back to me. It's a common word in the medical industry. And, and yeah. the, the placebo effect. Oh, placebo, of yeah, course. Yeah. I was yeah. just so, so we talk about the placebo effect. Like all of a sudden, you know, we believe something. We believe we are better and, or we're taking a sugar pill that's healing us. And then we, and we're healed, you know, essentially, at least for that time frame. That's because our thought is affecting our outcome. And, it, and you know, unfortunately, the medical industry avoid or invalidates the placebo effect. But I think the placebo effect is a part of the healing process. So... In fact, it's more powerful than all the stuff we take. And so, because you know, we hear these. I mean, there's so much research I could talk about that, but there's, it's our, it's our thought. Our thought and our emotional states are affecting. And once again, they're affecting the outcomes of everything around us. And then it goes back to the fear and trust. The more trust, the more we are in a state of trust, the more powerful and impactful those thoughts are, to move us to a higher, you know, frequency or a higher potential. And the vice and the opposite for fear. So when Tesla said that, like, wow, we are not only insignificant cosmically, but we're extremely precious and extremely powerful and influential on what happens to the universe. So it makes, uh, it kind of reversed the lens on me. Like, wow, every person's thought, feeling, action, emotion matters. And it has a direct impact on everything that's going on. They they do indeed. And uh, one of the things that that I teach is that it's not enough to walk into the boardroom and act the right way because it doesn't work very well. No. If you walk into the boardroom and you act the right way and you are the right way, you feel the right way, you'll get what you were looking for. Like things happen the way they're supposed to. Mm-hmm. And and I always believed in the model of if you you know do the right thing, you do what what you're supposed to do for the situation that you'll get what you want and it turns out there's there's multiple levels to it and I think we're we're both saying the same thing yeah. but whether it's uh, it, it's from a field, and I I tend to agree with you, it is from a field. One we either haven't measured, or it, it may be an information field. Mm-hmm. If you look at some of the very new random, you know, I don't want to call it random uh, new, highly unusual science around information field density. There's probably something in there about it, but yeah. honestly, I haven't studied enough to know. But I, I do know that in the practice of doing what I do as an entrepreneur and a dad and all the other stuff. Like you've got to have like the behavior and the inner part in alignment. Otherwise, like things don't move. Right. Yeah. You have to have that presence of mind and that's how things happen. Right. And, and that's that's, of course, challenging to teach. Right. As sure. you know, because you're a yoga teacher where funny what's going on in the mind also affects whether you can stand on one leg and close your eyes and all the other things that, that you do in yoga. Yeah. You know, it's funny you say that. So what I found the way I teach and what I found to be most effective is to mm-hmm allowed them to experience the differences. Like that yes example, where I took them through the yes journey, and I took them through the no journey, which is a very short journey, they immediately felt the difference. I didn't have to explain anything. They just knew and applauded as a result. So it was, it was it's very obvious. So when I teach, and even that six-year-old that I told, told, told you about, I was letting him discover when he was emo- in different emotional states and become aware of that. The, the, this whole fear kind of... Um, journey, you know, expedition I've been, you know, chasing for the last, you know, over a decade now, all I've really done is put myself into states that where I felt like I'd be confronting fear for me and observe my emotions as I'm confronting it. And then as I'm not confronting it and look at the Delta, the difference between the two and see what is changing and then finding the pattern between that. And that's how I've unraveled a lot of these things I'm writing about now. Um, It's really pointing out the differences. And if someone can't 
exactly they're not equipped or trained to identify those internally, then it's just pointing it, you know, pointing them to look there. And then they start learning really fast. And once they get on the, once they get, once they start figuring how to notice the differences in emotional and thought states, they can learn anything at that point. And the six year old, so that six year old from first, first day of six year old or first day of first grade, he was learning single digit addition, two plus one equals three. Mm-hmm. At the end of four months, I spent probably an hour an evening with them for like four nights a week. I got him up to basic algebra. He was solving equations two thirds X plus 195 equals 268 and solving for X and then graphing it and doing all sorts. He, he knew his squares, the square roots. He knew pretty much everything up to base, you know, what would normally be like sixth, seventh, eighth grade level in four months. Wow. And that's because I was teaching him patterns, you know, pattern recognition and, and internal processing and internal, you know, delta identification. So it's, you know, that just opened up to learning more languages and everything else started just getting better. He started embodying more confidence with themselves, talking about bullies, you know, all sorts of cool, interesting things started to happen. Uh, it's, it's amazing what that confidence will do. Yeah. We're, we're coming up on the end of the show, Ravi, and I want to ask you this question. I think you'll have a unique perspective on it. It's okay. one I've asked every guest in more than 250 episodes. So, like, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> Given all the stuff you know, all, all your experiences, if someone came to you tomorrow and they said, look, I want to perform better at everything, like, like I want to kick ass at whatever it is I want to do, what are the three most important things I need to know? What would you say? I would say, and I actually just had this question and I could tell you the result, but um, I would say one, focus on trust, you know. Start exercising your trust, and you can do this by various ways, saying yes, you know, starting with the word yes, and so on and so forth. Um, two, find what you really care about. If, you know, try to start off with your authentic self from the beginning, instead of moving into these spaces where you feel like other people want you to do something else. Figure out what you really care about and passionate about, because the sooner you get there, that's when your life really begins. Everything else is just a journey to start your life. And, and once you figure that out, you have a really fun time and you know ahead of you. And then three, I would say would be try to understand people. Um, and that's when, when, I mean, everything has to do with interacting with people, right? Or the environment. So whatever you're interacting with, try to understand, you know, versus judge and assess and whatnot. Because the more you understand, the more knowledge you gain, and the more appreciation you have. And that's all falls in that trust realm. It just moves you naturally to trust and the more power you have because you can't, it's very hard to direct things or manage things into or create things without understanding what all the, you know, all the other elements are. And we tend, we were so quick to judge and assess that, which is a fear driven emotion that, um, that we miss out on so much in life. And, um, so I would say those three things I'd say, you know, learn to trust, um, Figure out what your what's most authentic to you. You know your passion. That all that stuff will change over time. But keep following that. Keep tracking that, and try to understand. Cool. Well, th- thanks for sharing that. And yeah. now share a couple of more things. <laughs> you have your new your new show, Aspire. You have uh, Flow, which is premiering, and you have your book uh, about Tesla. Where can people find out more about your work? Uh, give me some URLs. Sure. Um, the Inventor series is the Tesla graphic novel, and I'm developing other graphic novels as a series, as a part of that. Um, Flowtheshow.com is for the upcoming show, which is kind of like yoga cross circus led to my live piano concert. And then aspireshow.com is the URL for Aspire, which is, once again, a piano concert curated to a series of TED-style talks all around unlocking the secrets of human potential. Beautiful. Awesome. Well, thanks for being on Bulletproof Radio. I totally appreciate it. Thank you. Great. It was fun. If you enjoyed today's episode, uh, do me a favor. Go out and check out Ravi Mehta's work. It's pretty interesting stuff. And when his book on hacking fear comes out, I'm pretty sure it's going to be an interesting read. Because whether you really uh, know this or not, the reason you procrastinate, the reason you don't do the things that you want to do is oftentimes fear. But it's not the kind of fear that you can easily see or recognize, but it's in there somewhere. So if, if you spend your time hacking your fear in one way or another, including the ways we talked about, uh, well, you will kick more ass, and that's what this show is all about. Have an awesome day.